Great, thanks, Christina. Um, did you want to do a brief introduction to Zoom for participants first? I can do that. Um, so good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Christina Diakis. I'm an outreach specialist for Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Lab. Um, I will be your behind the scenes tech support today. Um, we are recording this webinar. I know I'm seeing some questions about that. Um, the website on your screen, that go.osu.edu slash OCCC, is where that recording will be posted, probably towards the end of next week. Um, all attendees today are in listen-only mode. Everyone is muted with cameras off. Um, as you have questions for our speakers today, um, please put those in the Q&A box. If you're not currently seeing that, there should be a Q&A button either at the bottom or the top of your screen depending on your zoom settings um, if you're having any technical problems today please send me an email dickis.10 at osu.edu um, you can respond to the reminder you got on wednesday or um, my email is in your registration confirmation as well um, at the end of our conference today when you close out the zoom window your web browser will pop up a link with a survey for us if you wouldn't mind taking that survey that helps us improve the conference and bring you other programming that would be helpful to you. Um, we will also be sending you a follow-up email towards the end of next week with the link to the recording, as well as another link to that survey. Um, I think that's everything, but did I miss something, Tori? I don't think so. Uh, I think you covered it very well. Thank you so much, Christina. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Uh, welcome. It's going to be a beautiful day here in Northwest Ohio, wherever you're viewing from. Hopefully, it's also going to be beautiful. Um, for your Saturday morning screen time, we have some uh, really fantastic speakers. Uh, we really hoped that we would be in person again this year. Um, there were some hurdles, and we obviously were not able to do that. We found over the last couple of years, though, that there are some benefits, uh, like the recording uh, that Christina mentioned, and I know there are some folks from uh, other states that normally would not be able to join us. So um, those of you that are from far away, thanks for joining us again here this morning. Uh, we did trim the conference down a little bit, as you probably noticed in the agenda, um, but not much. We have uh, still a lot of quality speakers, uh, and we're, we're really looking forward to that. Um, with that, I think we will just go ahead and get into it. So to kick off our meeting, um, we have Chief Kendra Wecker for the Ohio Division of Wildlife, and she's going to bring you the ODNR Lake Erie perspectives. Thank you, Chief Wecker, for joining us this morning. Thank you, Tori. Thanks for having me here online. I'm going to attempt to share my screen, so bear with me for one minute. sharing. Okay, I had it here a minute ago, and this is what happens. <laughs> the moment of truth. It's the technology gremlins. Uh, it is. Okay, just bear with me. I'm going to put myself on mute for one second here. Okay, I'm going to need you to walk me through something here. I've got my PowerPoint open, but I'm not seeing it when I go to share it. Can Christina walk me through something here? Yeah, um, so when it's open and then you go to the green share screen button at the bottom of your screen, it should give you a screen one, screen two option. And it should show the PowerPoint in one of those screens. Or alternately, there might be an option to share PowerPoint the app. Okay, not seeing it. 
Oh, that's a new one. Yeah, this is a new one. <laughs> hmm. I don't think it's probably too big. I can email it to somebody quickly. Yeah, that works. Let's see. Okay, Christina, can you um, point out your email to me? Well, that or I can just talk. We can just forego the images and I'll just have to talk. And that's um, okay. My email is uh, diakis.10 mm -hmm. at OSU. And then once I get it, I can pop it up for you if you want to get started and then we'll catch up. Sorry, repeat that again. K C H or D, D. Oh, just D I E R K E S dot one zero at O S U dot E D U. Okay. I'll send it to you. There you go. Let's see if it comes through. Meanwhile, um, I will start to talk. So Sorry for the technical difficulties there, folks. Um, welcome to the annual High Sea Grant Charter Captains Conference, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, we do look forward to seeing you in person at the next event or even before then at some point here in the near future. But we do appreciate this long and successful partnership with the Charter Captains Sea Grant and the Division of Wildlife. And this partnership is based on good communication, which helps us address all the important issues that affect the charter industry, Lake Erie and Ohio. And one example of your great stellar support has been for water quality monitoring issues and the clean water initiatives that we had going on in the Lake Erie region. Um, you may have been familiar with the H2 Ohio program initiated by Governor DeWine, and it continues to provide support for projects to improve water quality in the Western basin of Lake Erie and throughout Ohio and promotes the departments of agriculture, EPA and ODNR working together in the shared effort. And during the last three years of H2 Ohio, nearly 12,000 acres of wetlands have been restored and 100,000 acres of watershed are being filtered by wetland projects. And we're really excited about this. Um, we're filtering water and we're also creating great habitat for people that like to hunt and fish and watch wildlife. And also 40% of the Western Basin cropland is enrolled in soil conservation programs. So we are making progress and we appreciate your support. The H2 Ohio program has uh, been dedicated another $50 million this 2022 and 2023. So we continue that work within ODNR and we, again, we continue your support. I had a few images to show you of some projects, but we'll skip that for now. But anyways, um, it really is an exciting time for conservation and for water quality improvement here in Ohio with this huge investment by Governor DeWine and the legislature. So we expect to see more projects on the ground. And I know in ODNR, we have 82 projects on the ground right now. And we're really excited about that. Oh, there we go. I think we see some of the images. So this one here depicts the Red Horse Bend project that was managed by the Black Swamp Conservancy and built by the design build consulting firm Biohabitats. The project restored 32 acres of wetland floodplain to the Sandusky River near Fremont, Ohio, and the restored area 
had previously been diked and intensively farmed. So obviously it looks a lot different now. It's, it's more along with uh, what nature meant it to be at the time of, of developing wetlands years, years, years ago. The main road bisecting the site is the State Route 620 bypass around Fremont and Sandusky County. And the project was completed this past, oh, I'm sorry, the, yeah, past May, not this May 22, but May of 21, it was completed. Next slide. Can I control this now, Christina, or are you controlling it? I think I have to do it for you. Okay. And it should be showing the Sandusky River slide now. Okay, so that's, just, okay, go to the next one, please. <clears throat> um, this past year, 2021, the walleye hatch and the Western Basin Illa perch hatch were both excellent, which is great to hear and uh, continues to be exceptional. Uh, it will maintain stable population in coming years, which we're very happy to share. Um, however, the central basin perch hatches were poor and conservative, conservative quotas will continue. Um, not a surprise there for most people. Um, and we do have the staff watching that very closely. Next slide. The walleye population and catch rate are at all time highs and provide incredible fishing. As many of you already know, not, I'm not telling you something you don't know. And over 2 million walleye were harvested in Ohio waters last year. And your continued promotion of this fish, fishery brings anglers to Lake Erie from all around the state and the country. And we can continue to maintain the title of walleye capital of the world. And we envision this for many years to come. Next slide. On to yellow perch, which we know uh, was unpredictable fishing in the West and challenging to say the least in the Central Basin. We will continue to set appropriate harvest levels through the Great Lakes Fish Commission Lake Erie Committee and using our science-based management ensures the best opportunity for recovery of perch populations. Next slide. We had some exciting um, uh, new ads with Lake Erie law enforcement. Uh, we do have a new boat in the water operating, which we're really happy to have. And we continue to diligently patrol both sport fishing and commercial fishing on Lake Erie. Um, the Lake Erie staff routinely collaborates with county officers to effectively enforce fishing laws. And we have both uniformed and plain clothes operations providing coverage and communication with the captains is vital to continue these wonderful enforcement needs <clears throat> and helping us identify where we need to be. Obviously the lake is a large body of water and, and we have you know, just a handful of officers, but they're there to work with you side by side. Next slide. The Lake Erie Fisheries offices will be fully staffed soon, and we are pursuing um, the funding to, to uh, build a new vessel and replace the Explorer that some of you may be familiar with. Um, currently, we um, have just posted for three full-time fisheries biologists, and we hope to have those filled soon. One will be in our Sandusky office and the other at our Fairport Harbor office. So uh, we are looking for some great staff to add and again, be fully staffed and focusing on our Lake Erie issues that we have. We're excited to be working with Sea Grant and Charter Captains to build a stewardship certification program. And that's new. And some of you may have heard about that. And this voluntary program will provide conservation education for interested captains and help promote the industry and an awareness of conservation stewardship. A focus group and advisory panel are providing insight to tailor the program to captain's needs. And we hope to have this program available <clears throat> prior to the 23 fishing season. Next slide. So apologize for the technical inconvenience here early on, but thank you very much for attending this year's conference. And I do appreciate the opportunity that Tori Gabriel and Chris Winslow of Ohio Sea Grant have provided to say a few words this morning. Um, I wanna point out that the background images for the Division Wildlife staff today are featuring the Appalachian Hills Wildlife Area. That's the newest wildlife area in the state of Ohio. Um, we were provided the money from the General Assembly and from Governor DeWine to purchase 
what was the former recreation lands out in southern southeast Ohio. Um, it will be the single largest state wildlife area in, in Ohio, and uh, we'll finish that um, acquisition this summer. So um, if you have time to get off the lake and you want to come visit another part of Ohio, um, there are over 300 lakes or ponds and lakes on this wildlife area. So we have a lot of fishing going on, a lot of bass fishing and hunting out there. So I just wanted to feature that today for you. And again, thank you for this great partnership with our host, Ohio Sea Grant. And I hope everyone today has a very productive and fruitful conference, as well as no more technical glitches for anybody else speaking after me. So with that, thanks and have a great day. Thank you, Chief Wecker. Uh, are there any, any questions? So we, we have a couple minutes here. I am monitoring the Q&A box. If anybody has any questions for Chief Wecker about any of that material, feel free to type them in uh, and we will ask them. And thank you for mentioning the, the uh, voluntary certification program that will be um, and, and part of my talk is one of the opportunities at the at the very end of the program. So uh, we will go into that in a bit more detail, but thank you for, for mentioning that. I am not seeing any questions roll in. So uh, I would say, I'm not sure how long you can stay with us, Chief Wecker, but- um, I'll stay on for a little while, certainly. Okay. Can you monitor, can panelists monitor the, uh, the Q&A? They should be able to, yes. There's a, a Q&A button at the bottom there and I did just see a question pop up. Okay, yes. Uh, when is the first day we can get our guides license? So that would probably Matt Leibengood actually can answer that question. Sure, I can answer that question. Please. Um, and I actually, I was going to discuss that in my uh, presentation as well, but um, um, you'll get an email from Katie Cade on uh, March 16th. Um, don't fret that because you are licensed through April 15th. Um, there are some... Um, Nuances, I'll call them nuances with our, our licensing system that um, don't allow us to, to, to sell last year's license now and um, this year's license or next year's license now at the same time. And we have people that, um, we have some, some things in place to help folks that want to um, buy their first time guide license right now, we can help that out, help them. But if you already have your license, don't fret, you will be able to get it. And you'll get that email from Katie, March 16th. Thank you, Matt. Uh, I, I don't know if this is a follow-up question, uh, but she also asked, will the building in Sandusky be open on the 15th? I assume that's, that's March 15th. Currently, the office is open Tuesday through Thursday, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Um, and by appointment, um, we can make arrangements if folks need in there at a certain time. Okay, and then um, she asks, or can we only do it online? And I assume that's referencing signing up for your guide license. While it's preferable for online applications, um, it's not the only option. There, there is that in-person option. Great. Okay, well, thank you guys very much. Uh, thank you for those questions and thank you, Chief Wecker, for kicking off our program again today. Uh, next up, we have the status of Lake Erie Fisheries and 2022 Fishing Outlook by Eric Weimer, who is the supervisor of the Sandusky Fisheries Research Unit for the ODNR Division of Wildlife. Good morning, Eric, and it is all yours. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, special thanks to uh, Tori and to uh, Christina for 
arranging everything and inviting uh, me to participate. I appreciate it. And always look forward to an opportunity to, to kind of go over um, what, what the status of Lake Erie was in 2021 and also what we look forward to in the upcoming year. So I'm going to start by giving just a quick overview of the Lake Erie fisheries management process, the interagency process that we use to, to set our limits and, and uh, quotas uh, each year. Uh, and then I'm going to dip into some species specific uh, information like I usually do, uh, walleye, uh, followed by yellow perch, and then rounding off with smallmouth and largemouth bass. So the reminder slide uh, of our, our management process for yellow perch and for walleye. This is an interagency process that starts with um, the uh, work that we're doing here in the upper left, uh, the, all of the assessment surveys that we do. Um, we assess uh, sport harvest, we assess commercial harvest, and then we also run a series of surveys to, uh, that are uh, fishery independent surveys like our trawl and our gillnet surveys and electrofishing surveys to, to gather population information for the, the species that we're managing. These, these surveys are done in all of the jurisdictions around Lake Erie. And uh, our field season kind of ends with the um, combining of all of these data sets and um, incorporating that, that information into a task group model. There's a task group model for a walleye and then a, set, a second set of models for yellow perch management. Um, those models, the results from those models are combined with the trawl projections for age two um, fish entering the fishery to give us a population estimate each year. That estimate is then uh, deliberated on by the uh, Lake Erie Committee and results in the announcement of a uh, total allowable catch or TAC. Uh, this year, the TAC will be for walleye and yellow perch will be announced on March 25th. So just a couple of weeks away. Uh, and so you kind of see where we are in the process. After the announcement of that TAC, uh, that, uh, those, those quotas get split up uh, by jurisdiction. And that's when uh, we in Ohio then can determine what our uh, daily bag limits for uh, walleye and for yellow perch, as well as any uh, commercial quota for yellow perch for the upcoming season. Uh, and then that's when we get back into our field work uh, again for the, for the next year. So we're currently right here in the process and, and just a couple of weeks out from rounding out the process for the year. So now let's talk about walleye. So in 2021, uh, we had over 3 million hours of targeted walleye effort in Ohio. Uh, the figure that you can see is, is the uh, annual uh, targeted walleye effort from 1980 to the present. Uh, you can see that uh, overall, there's been a downward trend since about the 80s, but a, a steady incline in the last uh, five, six, seven years uh, the last few years, we've been at about a, a, around 3 million angler hours uh, of targeted walleye effort uh, each year. That effort uh, resulted in uh, the harvest of uh, almost 2.5 million walleye in 2021. Um, in the last 20 years or so, our fishery has been about a 1 million fish per year fishery as, as far as harvest goes. So you can see that right now we're in a, a, a great spot where um, fishing and, and harvest uh, is at a, at, a, at a peak, at least in the last 20 years. Uh, harvest in 2021 was dominated by fish in the 2018 uh, and the 2015 year classes. So harvest and effort together gives us a harvest rate. 
Um, and in 2021, our lake-wide uh, harvest rate in Ohio uh, was 0.61 fish per hour. Um, this was a combined rate, both sport and charter anglers. Um, if we separate the charter anglers out, it, the, the charter specific harvest rate was closer to 0.8 fish per hour, so a little bit higher. Um, and while it looks a little bit lower than what we saw uh, two years ago or, or three years ago, um, bear in mind that, that 0.6 fish per hour is still an extremely high uh, harvest rate uh, for any walleye fishery, uh, even here in Lake Erie. Uh, so it is certainly nothing to complain about. Uh, and just as a an explanation, maybe I got this question a couple of years ago, a harvest rate um, of let's say one fish per hour, if, if you had uh, six anglers go out and fish for six hours and they caught their limits, their 36 fish limit, that would equal one fish per hour of uh, harvest rate. So that gives you some perspective of where we are. The, the best news or the good news keeps on coming, I guess, as far as uh, hatch strength goes. Uh, what you see on here is the Western Basin interagency trawl results for a young year walleye in 2021. Uh, so this is combined Ohio and Ontario trawl data. Um, we had a record hatch in 2021 um, equal to 345 fish per hectare. I also mentioned that a hectare is equal to about two and a half acres. Uh, so it's the metric uh, designation for, for area. Um, so it's, it's been, uh, it was an excellent hatch and it follows up on, it's really the fourth year in a row of uh, above average hatch. Um, in this time series, an average hatch is uh, designated by this line which is 55 walleye per, per hectare. And you can see that uh, 2018, 2019 um, were well above average. 2020 was a good, strong, above average hatch. And now we've got another record hatch in 2021. So the future looks bright uh, for walleye uh, on Lake Erie. So population model estimate. Uh, this is the 2021 model run. So this is the model run estimate from last year. Um, this will, like I mentioned before, will be updated in, in a, another couple of weeks. So you might see this data point change a little bit higher or lower. Um, but it, our 2022 predicted uh, walleye population is about 95 million uh, two-year-old walleye uh, based on last year's model run, which is a, a really high population. And obviously we have more fish coming in behind it. So um, we are really excited about the, the future here for walleye. So just to kind of summarize our expectation for the, the 2022 walleye season, um, we expect it to be outstanding like it has been the last couple of years. We have a large population of walleye, uh, many year classes contributing to that population, and we have more coming in. Um, we've had uh, great hatches in 2015, uh, more uh, really strong hatches 2018 to 2020, and another record high last year. Um, catches we expect will be dominated by age two to four fish, so those 15 to 22 inches, uh, but there's going to be plenty of um, older fish, uh, 2015 year class, 2014 year class and older uh, that will be providing larger, uh, even trophy sized uh, fish. Um, I will uh, expect that there will be a lot of uh, short fish to be sorted through this year, um, but I think that's, a, that's a, an excellent place to be in. Having multiple year classes and not relying on one is a, is a great thing. So now let's transition over to, to yellow perch. Um, this figure uh, we developed last year because we started to, uh, well, we had to make some, some changes to our, our walleye uh, uh, daily limits. 
uh, based on uh, uh, small populations in in the central base or central zone. Um, so one of the one of the things, if I slip into this, uh, just remember that uh, zone to me means management unit, and so sometimes I find myself uh, mixing the two up a little bit. But here in Ohio, we have a west zone, uh, which uh, is west of the uh, 8230 line, or sorry, the 8120 line, um, and, uh, or no, no, that's the 8230 line. And then our central zone uh, and east zone boundary is the 8120 line, which is just um, west of Fairport Harbor uh, in the, between Mentor and Fairport Harbor. Uh, so knowing where you are on the lake if you're perch fishing is gonna be very important for the next, uh, for the upcoming season uh, as it was for last year. So again, targeted um, yellow perch uh, angler effort. This is uh, Ohio lake-wide. Um, it, it was a targeted effort was um, a little up from the last couple of years, but still fairly low in the time series, uh, over 600,000 uh, targeted uh, angler hours. Um, the majority of the, this effort was in the west zone or, or management unit one in the western basin. Um, we've seen a, a fairly steady decline in um, effort uh, over the last five to 10 years. Um, part of that being driven by really good walleye fishing. Uh, people are choosing to chase walleye rather than perch, but also partially due to kind of the known struggles uh, in our yellow perch populations in the central basin. Uh, this is uh, a figure of angler harvest for yellow perch. Uh, we harvested uh, 1.3 million fish in 2021. That, I, that, that number is wrong. It's 2021. Um, again, similar trend over the last five to 10 years with declines, but a slight increase driven mostly by uh, good harvest in the West Basin, uh, especially last fall. Um, and just in case you're curious, most of the, the harvest in uh, the west zone were of age two yellow perch. So those should be um, sticking around in the fishery for a couple more years. Our uh, yellow perch angler harvest rate uh, it, for, for Ohio waters was just under two fish per hour which is an increase over the last couple of years, but still uh, down um, compared to our 15 to 20 year time series where we were mostly a uh, three fish per hour fishery. I, I will also mention that, you know, while these are really um, uncomfortably low harvest rates, uh, we have been in places before uh, where we've had similar rates and, and the fishery has recovered. So uh, we just need to get some hatches. And speaking of hatches, here are the results for, this is the Western Basin uh, Interagency Trawl Survey, Ohio and Ontario surveys combined. Uh, we had a really uh, strong uh, second highest interagency yellow perch hatch in the West that we've had uh, since 2000. Um, with uh, 1,300 yellow perch per hectare uh, in 2021. Uh, this builds on the last um, eight years of really solid uh, yellow perch hatches in the West uh, and is, is uh, due in, in great part to, to the reason why we have such a, a solid fishery uh, in the West Basin right now. The central basin, uh, the central zone and east zones are, are a different story and continue to be a different story. Uh, we had low hatches in 2021 um, with uh, the central zone uh, having uh, an index of uh, just under 11 uh, yellow perch per hectare and uh, the east zone having uh, just over two uh, yellow perch per hectare younger years uh, in the trawl survey. Uh, we have not still had a, a, a good yellow perch hatch 
since the really the 2018 season. Uh, and that's uh, uh, definitely a different story compared to the the time period of you know 2000 to 2010 or 12, where we had uh, pretty consistent every other year strong hatches in the central basin. Those hatches really have driven where we are for our um, adult yellow perch populations. Uh, based on the 2021 model year, uh, we see that in the, the black line here on top is where uh, we are estimated to be uh, in the west zone or, or western basin, and that's a population of 63.2 million fish. Um, the uh, East zone is below that at 46.2 million uh, fish, and these are two year olds and older. And the central zone uh, is, is estimated to be 33.4 uh, million uh, adult yellow perch uh, in that basin. Um, and while you might look at these and see that they're all fairly similar as far as the yellow perch abundance goes in each basin, uh, bear in mind that the Western Basin is the smallest area-wise of these three basins, uh, with the, uh, the, the central zone being much larger. And so while there are fewer fish in the central zone, they're also spread out over a, a larger area, uh, which really will uh, continue to impact our fishery there. Now, any of you that have fished for uh, yellow perch in the last five, six years, um, may have seen some images like this or um, when you uh, cut the fish open and seen this, this uh, pile of, of uh, interesting looking stuff in their diets. Um, these are invertebrates. Um, a, a lot of these in this picture are uh, bithotrephes or spiny water fleas. And while our, our perch populations have been uh, low, uh, we've also been uh, dealing with this apparent diet shift that we've talked about for several years now. Um, and I wanted to show you uh, a couple of figures to kind of um, emphasize that this is probably contributing to some of our low uh, angler harvest and catch rates. Um, our central basin office in Fairport Harbor has recently uh, been working with uh, scientists from the USGS here in, in Sandusky to take a deep dive into the diet data that they've been collecting uh, since uh, the, the, the 90s. Uh, and they've found some really interesting trends that, that back up uh, our concerns about uh, diet and how they might be affecting our fishery. Um, first off, uh, this figure, it shows you the, the occurrence of, of fish in the diet of yellow perch in the central basin. And you can see that over the time series, the, uh, the percentage of, of fish that we're seeing in the diet has steadily declined uh, to where we are now. Um, that is something that, that reflects both, um, uh, at least over part of that time period, uh, reflects a, a decline in the uh, population of emerald shiners in the lake. Um, and also uh, really uh, highlights the, the, the decline in round gobies in, in parts of the lake too, uh, which are both, uh, at least historically, have been uh, important parts of the yellow perch adult diet, especially late summer and early fall. But this is the more interesting of the figures uh, in that uh, we see that starting in about 2010, we see a large increase in the uh, amount of um, spiny water fleas or, or bithotrephes that are in yellow perch diets, an increase of uh, 13% uh, there, which is a pretty significant jump during that time period and does line up really well with the decline in emerald shiners as well. Not saying that one has directly to do with the other, but it is an interesting overlap. We've also seen in the larger time series a, uh, an increase in the, um, uh, the amount of uh, chironomids or midge larvae uh, in the diets of uh, yellow perch. Uh, those midge larvae live down in the bottom of the, the lake in the sediments and are uh, uh, becoming a, a very important part 
of the diet of yellow perch as well. They've always been used, but it's definitely been increasing. So what, what, what does this mean for, for anglers? Um, we've said several years that um, there are some things that anglers might try doing uh, to increase their odds. Um, we've talked about trying to match the hatch, you know, downsizing presentations, trying different types of baits and different depths. Um, we've suggested um, moving around uh, a lot to try and find active yellow perch um, based on how their, their feeding patterns may have changed as they're targeting these invertebrates. Um, but a couple of other things to consider, uh, and we've seen this kind of bear out the last couple of years. The, the literature tells us that um, spiny water fleas in particular will stop uh, or slow their, their reproduction uh, as water temperatures get around 80 degrees or so. And what we've seen the last couple of years is in July, when our water temperatures are at, at its highest, uh, we've seen really good yellow perch fishing. And we, we've kind of hypothesized that perhaps um, that's a, because the, the prey item, this bithotrephes, is uh, on the decline because they're not reproducing because of the water temperature, which is then forcing uh, yellow perch into more uh, traditional feeding patterns uh, and making them more susceptible to angling. Um, I guess that is something that we're kind of uh, toying around with and, and, and kind of makes sense to us, but we don't have data necessarily to support that right now. Uh, the one thing that we can tell you is that if you hear, if you're interested in perch fishing and you hear of a good bite, don't wait around. Um, they, the, the bite has not lasted uh, like it traditionally has uh, for long periods of time. Um, if you hear of good fishing, get out there and take advantage of it while you can, because it might only last a couple of weeks. So what do we expect for our fishery in, in the upcoming season? We certainly feel like our uh, population in the west zone is, is fishable. If you're going to make the choice to target yellow perch in Lake Erie, the, the west is the place to start. Uh, the central basin uh, remains relatively low, especially in the central zone, uh, and uh, we anticipate that catch rates will likely remain similar to what we've seen the last couple of years. Um, perhaps better catch rates in the west, uh, but we expect them to be fairly low. Um, in, in the west, our, our catch this year will be dominated by age three fish. Um, and uh, we expect that, that fish that, that might be picked up in uh, the central zones should be probably dominated by uh, age fours or, or, or so. Um, but it, it's still going to be um, much better odds to, to fish in the West. And we do anticipate that these diet um, factors are going to impact uh, fishing in the west as well as the central. So it's not just a population thing. It, it is diet we feel like is impacting our, our angler catch rates and harvest rates. And, and we think that um, while we try and get a better whole handle on, on what might be causing them, um, it's, it's just a fact that we're going to have to deal with that uh, these fish may be switching what they're, what they're consuming and that might be changing their behavior. Lastly, I just wanted to give just a quick overview on, on what we expect for, um, for smallmouth and largemouth bass in the upcoming year. For smallmouth, our catch rate last year was around 0.6 fish per hour, which is really, uh, really pretty good. Um, still low effort uh, compared to previous years prior to 2004, um, but, um, but excellent uh, catch rates for those. Expect the catch to be dominated by two to four year old fish. Um, and the biggest ones, we had, a, we had a really good year class in 2017. So expect to see quite a few of those fish in, in the fishery uh, around that 16 inch mark uh, if, you're, if you're targeting them. For a largemouth bass, we, we saw last year almost twice the amount of effort targeting largemouth bass as we have in seen with smallmouth bass. Um, 
high catch rates. The largemouth are, are providing a really interesting fishery in the near shore areas um, and uh, catch rates of around one fish per hour um, are, are not unexpected for the upcoming year. Um, size wise, again, we're going to see mostly two to three year old fish caught, but we do have some larger six and seven year old fish that, that will be in that 16 inch range. And that is all that I have. Um, I'm happy to take questions, but also if you have questions or want to discuss anything with uh, walleye or yellow perch or other species, uh, feel free to reach out to the Sandusky or to the Fairport Harbor Fisheries Research Stations. Uh, and contact us, you can contact us through 1-800-WILDLIFE uh, or even submitting a, a, quest, a question online. It eventually gets to us if it's related to Lake Erie. And with that, thanks for your time and uh, I'll stick around for a few questions. Thanks, Eric. Uh, there was one and a follow-up in the Q&A box. So let's try to take a minute and do that. And then after, if there are any more folks that want to type in there, if you could monitor that Q&A box. But um, let's get to this, this one. With poor production, reproduction of the perch population over the last few years in the Central Basin, will they be continuing to commercial net this area this year? Uh, it will depend on what the, uh, what the tack is. Um, there will be, uh, that, that decision comes at the end of the month. Um, we, uh, we know that there's room uh, for some harvest, although minimal harvest. And I also want to make the point that uh, commercial uh, fishing quotas have declined at the very same rate that the, uh, um, that the angler uh, quotas have, uh, daily, the angler daily bag limits. So, um, we still intend on allowing harvest when we can, but we're going to be responsible about it. Um, so I hope that answers at least a little of your question. Yeah, and I think it answers the follow-up a bit too, but just to, to get that, uh, would it be better to pause the Central Basin commercial fish perch netting and also keeping lower limits on perch in Central Basin to allow a bit of recovery? We definitely plan on, uh, I mean, we have to decrease harvest in those areas and we will continue to do that. Okay, uh, there are a couple other coming in. I, I think we can roll uh, with a couple more of these real quick. Um, okay. Any discussion of raising walleye limits? You know, there's always discussions when we get uh, high walleye populations. Um, right now, I'll, I'll, I'll put it this way, right now we are really comfortable with where uh, we are as far as <clears throat> walleye harvest we have. Uh, increased the uh, spring bag limit uh, to six fish rather than four. Um, it, it's really a, phil a philosophical question on how we want to manage it. We intend to manage our walleye population conservatively because we know that these fish can live and contribute to a fishery for 15 to 20 years. We do not feel like beating down a, a, a walleye population is in our long-term best interest. Okay. Uh, there are a couple other great questions in there, Eric. If you could uh, get sure. to those, I wanna- I will, I will try and address those, yep. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have the Lake Erie Law Enforcement Update by uh, Lake Erie Law Enforcement Supervisor, Matthew Leibengood from ODNR Division of Wildlife. Morning, Matt, and it is all yours. Thanks a lot, Tori. Um, get my screen shared here. Should be seeing my screen in presentation mode if I'm not mistaken. Is that yes. correct? You are good. Great. Well, uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak to this group and um, um, just wanted to uh, I mentioned that uh, I'm now in my uh, beginning my third year as the as the uh, supervisor of our law enforcement unit at Lake Erie and um, been enjoying it and uh, I've, I've been uh, 
able to talk with a lot of you folks and solve some issues and um, and uh, try to keep things progressing into a into a manner that's uh, mutually beneficial for us. Um, some of you uh, <clears throat> may not know exactly what we do, and the uh, the list uh, continues to grow for our unit. But um, primarily, we we are uh, the folks that do commercial fish licensing and enforcement on Lake Erie. We do uh, sport fish enforcement. Um, one of the major things that we do is keep an eye out on the international boundary for encroachment of, of uh, gill nets that might be uh, set in our waters. We don't want them set in our waters. It's illegal to do so. Um, we do that with uh, airplane and also help with uh, the Coast Guard helps us out with that considerably. Um, hunting and waterfowl enforcement occurs for us uh, on the lake shore and out on the islands. Um, one of the newer things that's uh, brought into our, uh, into our, what we're looking at is aquatic invasive species. And I don't mean it just on the lake shore and in the lake, but I do mean this in um, other, other areas. Uh, so my uh, staff has been moving into looking at pet shops and things like that, where some of these aquatic invasive species are showing up also in the online trade. And one uh, case that you'll read about soon, soon enough involves some marbled crayfish, which are an interesting species um, where we've, uh, we've shut quite a bit of that down um, through some online sales. And then of course, uh, what's most important to you folks, I suppose, is uh, fishing guide licensing. Um, my staff, uh, I have uh, eight people on there. Um, a lot of you know, administrative professional Katie Cade. Uh, she is the, uh, the, the forward face, I guess, for uh, fishing guide licensing. And um, I mentioned that uh, you will receive an email from her on March 16th about relicensing and uh, everything will be handled just as it has been. Um, the rest of my, the folks on there are all enforcement folks. And uh, it's, we're fortunate. Uh, we, the majority of the staff on, on here are uh, officers or investigators that have more than 20 years of service or very close to approaching 20 years of service with the exception of uh, one of them on there um, um, who is a little younger than the rest, but uh, we have a lot of experience and some very good folks uh, to work with. <clears throat> um, I, as has become customary, uh, I, I'd like to share with you the statistics of, from the unit for 2021. Um, you can see there that uh, we, we, we uh, nearly 5,000 people were contacted to check for their fishing license. And this is just in my unit, I would like to mention. Uh, this doesn't include um, wildlife officers who have lakeshore counties, that sort of thing. But uh, just my unit, um, nearly 5,000 fishing licenses checked. We, um, we also uh, encountered uh, 283 hunters and trappers. We um, issued uh, 211 summonses um, on violations, but we also gave 211 warnings on violations. And um, this uh, commercial fish activity reports. Um, I'm going to go into that here in <clears throat> a couple more slides ahead to show you what those are all about. But uh, 381 of those were completed. And uh, as on the date that I made this uh, this presentation, there were 898 fishing guide licenses issued, which is up from last year's 827. And um, this. Uh, uh, increasingly abundant walleye, and um, well, I think the uh, the threat of really really good ice uh, gave us a jump in February. So uh, there you go. Um, I know that a lot of you are very familiar with how we conduct sport fishing enforcement, but I doubt many of you know or have a good understanding of how we enforce commercial fishing regulations. 
And so I wanted to take this opportunity to give you a, an, some insight into how we, we, we work uh, the commercial fishing industry. Um, this is just a, a list here of things that uh, I'm going to hit on in upcoming slides, but uh, there are a lot of things in place that help us to have one of the, what I feel is one of the best commercial fishing um, enforcement programs in the Great Lakes. First thing that we have is real-time vessel monitoring. And this image here is a depiction of what my officers can look at on their laptops from their vehicle at any given moment. Um, so what we see here are, if you, you, you can tell by looking at the map that we're looking at the lake shore here in the, um, uh, it would be the, uh, uh, the uh, Metzger Marsh area, um, Maumee Bay, neck of the woods over that direction. Um, if you look at the thin blue lines that uh, go uh, north and south and east and west, those are the, the 10 minute grid lines um, that the lake is broken up into uh, and each are numbered and each commercial uh, fisherman um, has to report based on their grid, their, their catch reports. So um, then the other thing you see in red there, the fine uh, red line and the red shaded area, those are areas that are off limits to commercial fishing. Um, the other thing that you will see is, uh, are you able to see my mouse hover through there? Yes. yes. Okay, so anyway, um, this, that line there uh, is, um, is a, a vessel track and, uh, and an officer can uh, zoom in on vessel tracks and we, can, we see this data historically. We can look at it from um, real time or we can look at it uh, from what was in the past. It's all stored in this system. They uh, uh, can look at these vessel tracks. They can determine where nets were set. Um, if we were to zoom in on this section here, um, we would see a lot, uh, several data points and we would know that there are some, some nets set in that area. Um, all of it is time stamped, as you can see on the left, um, gives you the, uh, uh, the speed over ground and um, uh, distance traveled and, and things like that. Um, so we, at any given time, we can look at this in real time and determine where a vessel is at that particular moment. <clears throat> the other component to that is, uh, is our catch reporting system, which is done in real time. Uh, each of the commercial fishing, fishing vessels here on the left um, has a device, uh, and it's usually done with a... Uh, it's now done with a, a, a mobile device such as a phone or a, a, a connected uh, tablet, whatever they, they chose to use. We don't limit what they can use to do this with. It's just, uh, it has to be done with our format. Um, but each time they uh, set a net, uh, pull a net, uh, lift a net, um, they have to interact with the system and it's done on the boat with the, this device. And that's also in real time, sends it up to uh, uh, the, the, the cell phone world and, uh, and then is stored in, in our uh, system because this is done uh, in-house. Um, we don't have a, a contractor or a outside contractor. This is all done um, within the Department of Natural Resources systems. Um, and then we can, from our vehicles, using our devices, look at the catch reports in real time. So we can compare catch reports and uh, vessel monitoring as far as locations um, instantaneously across one another. <clears throat> another couple of key components to that are when the commercial fishermen are on the water. 
they have to enter a estimate into the commercial uh, fish catch reporting system before they make it back to the dock. So it's supposed to be done um, uh, before a half an hour or uh, a half an hour before returning to the dock. The on water estimates are supposed to be entered. Uh, also, before entering another grid, um, an estimate is supposed to be transmitted um, to the to the catch reporting system. And then um, to further bolster our system, dockside weighing must occur for our quota species. Now, uh, the, the only quota species that we have are yellow perch, but all yellow perch have to be weighed dockside and um, before they're, they're taken off to a fish house. Another component that we use to keep good tabs on commercial fishing is we, we frequently visit fish markets. And by fish markets, it can be wholesale and retail. And um, a lot of, of course, the majority of fish that comes off of a, off of a commercial fishing vessel goes to a wholesaler first. Um, and so those folks are licensed by the Division of Wildlife. Uh, also transporters are, are licensed by the Division of Wildlife. And we all, we have inspection authority over both of those uh, types of licenses. And um, then by us visiting retail locations, you know, we can, look at the, their receipts and records and uh, keep tabs on um, whether fish are coming in in proper size um, and labeled appropriately and um, a whole host of other things um, involved there. So a summary of that is that uh, of the about commercial fishing there is um, you know we we keep our tactics random. Um, we're not always uh, visiting dockside. We may be looking from afar. Um, we may be just interacting with uh, the, the, the system and then looking at their catch in the future of where it ends up at the fish house. Um, but uh, the interactions are frequent and we document those. And that's what, where you had that number the 381 commercial fish activity reports. Um, the, anytime we interact with commercial fishing or the uh, industry as a whole as in these um, licensed uh, wholesalers or what have you, it all is documented on these commercial fish activity reports. Um, in my experience from what I found at uh, through my interaction with uh, the Great Lakes Fish Commission, I'm in a committee known as the Law Committee, um, which is uh, a compilation of law enforcement folks from all of the uh, Great Lakes states that uh, participate in the Great Lakes Fish Commission and also Coast Guard and tribal and what have you. Uh, our system is the envy of most of those folks. Um, we, we, we have a really good system in place. Um, here's a reiteration of wait till March 16th, you'll get an email from Katie Cade. Um, I will tell you this, if you come to the office, we, we, we don't have uh, a change drawer any longer. So we can accept cards and we can accept uh, checks, but uh, exact change for us is going to be a bit of a problem. Um, so we would rather deal with, uh, with checks and cards if at all possible. <clears throat> would like to uh, reiterate to you folks about um, reporting. Um, I know unlicensed guides are always a, a, a topic of concern for you. Um, I have, uh, you know, you have my guarantee that if you want to remain anonymous, we don't have to, inc we don't have to mention you at all. Um, if you give us uh, point us in the right direction, we will investigate to our best ability and, and try to make a case on these. Um, a couple of things that we would need uh, if, if you can supply it at all is boat, vehicle, and locale. If you can get us names, that's great. Social media screenshots are very helpful. Um, 
I would mention though that the social media screenshots aren't always a smoking gun. Um, so it, 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 it takes us a little bit to, to make those cases. Um, there's met, uh, several methods that you can use to contact us. Uh, one eight hundred poacher is a great way. WildOhio.gov. Uh, there's a place where you can submit information on there. You can talk to your uh, a wildlife officer if you encounter them. And on the last slide, I'll have my contact information if you if you want to just uh, let me know, and I'll I'll send somebody, get somebody directed to take care of it. Also. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I thought I'd try to come up with something to maybe every year um, some new information that you can be armed with. But uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, as a licensed fishing guide, you can keep more than 100 crayfish or more than 500 bait fish species without having to have a bait dealer permit, as long as you're having those for the purpose of providing bait to your customers. But a caveat to that is. You can have those fish, but um, to collect that many fish, you would need to have a bait dealer permit. So here, possession or, or keeping the bait um, on hand to provide to your customers is okay. But if you want to go ahead and collect those species more in more than those quantities, then you would need to have a bait dealer permit. And that's all I have, and I'm interest, or interested in any questions that you might have. Um, there's my contact information if you'd like to get a hold of me. Um, but uh, I think uh, I just went 17 minutes, so I'm not not too far off the off the mark. No, we're uh, thank you uh, for your talk. Uh, no, if we're off the mark, it's mostly for me uh, taking more questions than I should have earlier. Uh, but we can push our break back a little bit and shorten it. So there is one in here that I'd like to read to you, Matt, and then maybe if any more pop in, uh, maybe you can address them online. Sure. Uh, so with the new commercial monitoring system, how many commercial violations are still occurring? Well. Um... There, there are still violations out there, um, but I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's few and far between. It takes a lot um, of um, effort on their part to really violate if they were going to. Um, but uh, this has uh, really, since this, a lot of these were in place, um, from um, Senate Bill 77 and from 2007 on, um, this has uh, really counteracted any ability to to really violate, you know, you know, in a fashion that's really going to have a major impact on on commercial fishing. But we do still encounter violations. I don't have an exact number to give. Sorry. So, right, thank you for that answer. Uh, I don't see any, oh, another one did pop in there. Um, so if you could check out that Q&A and I recommend everybody uh, check out that Q&A. So uh, Eric Weimer and uh, Matt Faust who will also be speaking here this, this later this morning, uh, we're answering questions um, while Matt was talking. So uh, everybody go ahead and check out that Q&A. Uh, we are going to take, so we had it scheduled to come back at 1010. Let's come back at uh, 1015. So we shorten our break a little bit. So give everybody time to run and grab another cup of coffee or, or whatever they'd like. So we'll see you at 1015 with our next talk. And thank you to our speakers so far this morning. This is Captain Chris Stevens with the U.S. Coast Guard talking about Coast Guard news and 2022 requirements. Unfortunately, uh, Chris had a, a situation come up and he wasn't able to join us today, but he was able to uh, meet with us and record earlier in the week. So we still have his entire presentation. Uh, and then I have some contact information for him at the end of the talk as well, but you can see his phone number there on the screen right now as well. So um, Christina, I think we're good to go when you are. Sounds good. Um, let me know if there's any trouble with the sound or anything like that. Yep, thank you. Good afternoon, Coast Guard, uh, Ohio Charter Captains, uh, guests and uh, captains. Um, here we are another year of COVID and we are 
moving forward, trying to get out of this, and hopefully you guys will all have a great season. Uh, greetings, first of all, from uh, the captain of the port, uh, Brad Kelly and Commander Kaufman, uh, our deputy, and our person who's overseen the fleet, which is our OIC of prevention, um, Commander Franklin. Uh, so uh, the first slide that we have up here is uh, our contact numbers of people that if you have any questions about the presentation and or um, need information or signs, uh, please reach us. Uh, the, the, our key players are from MSU Toledo, Richard Minigas, and from uh, REC, which is a regional exam center, uh, Gretchen Hubbard, and District 9, our civilian in office is Mark Bobo, who oversees all passenger vessels, and um, myself, Chris Stevens from the auxiliary. Um, thank you for letting us be here. Uh, we're going to get right into the next slide here, which is our National Maritime Center announcements. Uh, very interesting that they've come up with a few things due to COVID and also due to uh, processing time both transactions at least 90 days in advance. Uh, that's because some of the people in the NMC are working remotely and they're only in the office to confirm and pick up uh, emails and, and written paperwork and faxes and texts and hard emails only um, a couple days a week uh, due to COVID and restrictions that they had. Hopefully with the numbers going down, that will open up, but as for right now, this still stands. The MNC website chat feature is a great feature and is a useful tool for getting in touch with the customer service people there. You can leave a message or some, uh, you can talk to them live. The last of the extensions for um, have an, ended October 2021 and no additional extensions are made or expected as we've had over the last couple of years due to COVID and people not being able to be in the office. Our series 719 forms dated 417 with an expiration listed as 33121 are currently still in use and the cycle update for the new forms behind and notice will be made when the new forms are in use. Next slide, please. Um, dealing with our RC, uh, Toledo Limited Services, um, that is due to, again, to COVID because of uh, the, the amount of restrictions that is put out by the Department of Homeland Defense, which actually regulates the buildings for uh, the amount of people that are allowed in it and the amount of social distancing and the amount of uh, exposure time in the uh, rooms themselves. So uh, they are going to keep appointment only for examinations or counter application transactions. Uh, so uh, we'll give you a, like, you can either call Gretchen or I'll give you a, uh, the contacting R-E-C-T-O-L at USCG.mil email um, is another way to contact them. Uh, the exam room, which normally seats between 20 and 25 people, is uh, reduced down to and will be remained at uh, five seats due to COVID social distancing. Please make sure you get those schedules early for any upcoming exams by contacting them at that email address, R-E-C-T-O-L at USCG.mil. The reason is is because uh, we're coming into the season a lot of people get behind on processing their applications um, some of the services are uh, really helping you folks out and they're doing a, a great job uh, some of the local um, providers that help get to and process your captain's license uh, heads, heads off to them uh, bravo zuvo for their jobs and getting your stuff prepped and put together right uh, correctly um, email and fax are the quickest methods for getting your application and processing queue at the REC. Um, that is due to, again, the amount of time that you have um, in the office by the people that are working there, their personnel. Uh, Pay.gov is the preferred method of uh, payment for your transactions. It's the easiest way for people to um, 
get everything processed. Next page is the, the duplicate application process. Um, a lot of people ask for this. Um, the process change for duplicate applications. If you need to request a duplicate uh, MOC, M MMC, I'm sorry, uh, you need to request uh, the duplicate. Uh, the declaration form or affidavit must be included with the application. They are no longer accepting a written, signed, and dated statement for loss of an MMC. That form, which is on the right here of the presentation, is available at HTTPS semicolon forward slash forward slash www.dco.uscg.mil forward slash NMC forward slash form forms forward slash. Uh, that's where the location of most of the forms are that you may need in the future. Our next um, slide is for you of those of you that are trying to process your applications on your own. Again, those services do a great job and they, they really do uh, a good job making sure that everything is correct. But if you are trying to process your application by yourself, these are the most common issues that they have at the ROC. Uh, missing pages or forms, especially when faxing or email, before you send your attachment to them, open the attachment and make sure that all the pages took place. Signatures on the forms, we all know there's a lot of dots and spaces and dates and initialing spots on our forms and applications. Make sure you go through those and they are all in order. Putting a date of birth next to the signature instead of the date signed is very common and it will cause that application to be rejected and sent back. Um, your oath has to be administered by a notary and that notary has to have a seal on it uh, stamped and with the date that they did that uh, oath that they administered it. And in some states, uh, notaries also have an ID number that they have to put in that is located on their stamps. Missing or incorrect fees. Again, they talked about pay.gov. The, uh, the REC must receive a copy of the receipt. Uh, keep a copy of that receipt and you can actually just put it at the end of your application packet to make sure that they get it. Drug test issues, one uh, older than 185 days uh, is, is a common thing. You know, you get your drug test and get it all set, get ready to go and you have a delay in your package that goes out and all of a sudden um, you're back into uh, an issue with uh, not being able to uh, have that application uh, processed because you've um, it, it's past 185 days. Also, uh, not signed by the uh, medical review officer is another issue that happens quite often. Um, random drug testing, uh, letter verbiage within six months of the application, including 60 days of the last 185 days verbiage. Um, Again, goes right back to the original statement just before with drug test issues. And then if you're using a TWIC exempt, you must mark the exemption box on the MMC application or complete a separate TWIC exemption statement, which is available um, on the website at the National Maritime Center. Our next slide goes into our contact information for the um, REC. Uh, that is Gretchen M. Hubbard. Uh, her email is available there, gretchen.m.hubbard at uscg.mil. Um, if you're using snail mail, the 420 Madison Avenues, ST Street, STE 700 Toledo, Ohio will work. Uh, remember that we talked that email is the fastest way of getting contact with the REC and getting appointments scheduled. The National Maritime Center uh, number, in case you have any issues with that or trying to get some uh, identification or old records, uh, that's the 1-888-427-5662 number. And that's their email in case you try to get to them. REC um, Toledo email submission for everything is REC 
tol at uscg.mil. And that will be available uh, for your review anytime you need to. Um, the next slide covers our random drug testing rate for crew members for 2022. So this is gonna be run from um, effective January 1st of this year through December 31st of 2022. Uh, we're looking at a minimum random drug testing rate of 50% of covered crew members. Uh, this was established uh, in accordance with the CFRs uh, which covers crew members in accordance with 46 CFR 16 TAC 230, and Marine employees are required by 46 CFR 16 TAC 500 to collect and maintain a record of drug testing data for each credit, each calendar year, and submit the data to the Coast Guard and the Management Information System system report by March 15th of the following year. Make sure that you folks get that done. Uh, moving on from the National Maritime uh, Center to uh, scheduling a UPV exam. Our next slide is uh, pretty simple to go through. Uh, go to cgox.org. That will be the first page that comes up. The header unit sign on the top bar, click on that and it will automatically move you into the drop down bar and go to District 9 Central. And then that will take us to our next slide, which will be on the left-hand column, I want a UPV exam. Once you go to that UPV exam button, you click on that, you'll get our next slide and next screen that'll appear, fill this out entirely. Um, one of the other things that you have on the right-hand side, uh, you have a calendar that you can kind of request um, times and days. Uh, we understand that we don't want to try to interfere with your fishing, so uh, we're going to try to make available um, exams on Friday evening um, or uh, sa early Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon. In the questions or comments, if you could, as uh, captains, please make sure that you put the location of the marina uh, or any identifying what main highway it's off. It just makes it easier for our examiners to do that. Uh, we did a, a total of about 198 uh, UPVs in the area last year. And if we could have our next slide, um, these are our three top discrepancies that we came up with uh, that we found uh, that were causes for people not to get their uh, UPV stickers on the first time. Improper amount and type of life jackets aboard a vessel, uh, non acceptable types, lights not functioning, just batteries uh, bad or bad buckles or straps on the life jackets. Uh, fire extinguishers, I'm sure that you're worth a uh, service that's helping you with your captain's license or keep maintaining it. Uh, you found that there's a whole bunch of stuff that's out with the 12 year fire extinguishers. That's all available online. So make sure that you check those this year. Passenger and logs are not filled out properly or not done at all. Very important to keep those things going. So what's the Coast Guard Auxiliary doing and the Coast Guard doing to help you out? Our next slide is we're uh, putting these up all over the place. We started up in Michigan. Uh, we partnered with uh, West Marine and with Safe Harbors. Um, those are a couple of our managers here up in St. Clair Shores near where I live. Uh, these are all over the store and all over the marinas. Uh, actually, Safe Harbors does not want any illegal charter captains in the uh, area at all. So we're going to make these signs available to you as charter captains also to place at your marinas. You can contact me and we'll ship them down to you. They are waterproof and uh, hard plastic and they last quite a, they last through the winter. Uh, so that, that's good stuff. Our next slide is uh, talking about our legal charters. Um, where do they come from? Uh, they come from boat sharing websites, the venue for recreational boat owners to rent out vessels for free, a fee. Uh, they got them on Facebook. They got them on Air, Airbnb. Um, they talk about languages for hire, but does not meet the regulatory requirements. So as they give you a captain, well, a captain could be somebody that puts on a captain hat. And we want to protect your industry uh, as, and make sure that the people that are out there are providing a good safe environment. Um, Passenger Vessel Act 
1993 provides clarifying legislation direction to what constitute inspection passenger vessels, small passenger vessels, uninspected passenger vessels, and bare boat charters. That's where it's coming from. Our next slide talks about concerns with the uh, illegal charters. We still need to reach out to the operators, clarify their re legal requirements associated with charting vessels. Licensed masters that take jobs offered by vessel owners and promoters need to be aware of what charters are, legal and illegal. That's why we're hitting the marinas and the uh, providers. Our last slide is if you have, um, uh, this is another part of uh, trying to get the awareness up. Uh, there's some phone numbers if you're a charter captain. Uh, there's a number that you can call anonymously, 313-568. 9560-247 at Sector Detroit and MSU Toledo down in your area, 419-418-6034. Uh, if you see anything that you think is an illegal charter, please make sure that you report it. These next, the next slide is also another slide, another hard board sign that is available for you. And it talks about, um, being a felony violation to include illegal charters. And if you have somebody that is uh, polluting or anything like that, these signs are available that we can send out with you in conjunction with the UPV illegal signs. And our last slide is questions and Tori will give you the, all the information necessary for that. Folks have a great charter season, uh, successful businesses and be safe. Thank you so much. Chris, and thank you to Christina for running that video. Um, for those of you that have Christians for Chris Stevens, I will put his information in the chat uh, there, right beside the Q&A button, there's a chat bubble. So in a minute when I'm done talking, I will, I will enter his email in there for you to contact him. Uh, he said if he can't answer a question, he'll make sure to get resolution uh, from the Resolution Center in Virginia. Uh, and he also has those UPV signs he talked about and um, and some inspection guides, a limited quantity of those as well, uh, that he would be able to get to interested folks. So again, that would be through emailing him. So I will put that in the chat momentarily. Our next speaker is Matt Faust. Before um, I introduce Matt, uh, just an update that it doesn't appear that Officer Jimmy Ray from US Customs and Border Protection is going to be able to join us at 1050. Uh, so very last minute, Matt Faust has graciously um, said he would uh, try, to, try to lengthen his talk a little bit because he's got some fascinating stuff to talk about. So um, just an update there. Uh, so let's go ahead and move to Matt's talk. Uh, Matt Faust is the fisheries biologist with the Sandusky Fisheries Research Unit for the Division of Wildlife. And he's going to be talking to us about understanding fish movements on Lake Erie. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you for that introduction, Tori. Can folks see my slides? Probably not in uh, presentation mode yet. That's correct, but now it is. Okay. All right. So initially when- so, uh, uh, that, that just went to presenter mode, so I can actually see, um, I can see your presenter mode as well. Okay. How about now? Now it is just the slide, it looks good. Okay. All right, so when, uh, sorry, my slides are screwed up here. When Tori asked me to present uh, at this meeting, he asked me to focus just on non-walleye uh, fish movement studies that's going, that are going on in Lake Erie. Uh, but as he mentioned, I get a chance to talk for a little bit longer, so uh, I, slid some walleye information into this. So um, should be a little bit of something for everyone here. Uh, as Tori mentioned, I'm one of the fisheries biologists at the Sandusky Fisheries Research Station in the Western Basin. And in addition to all of the walleye and yellow perch assessment work, uh, I'm heavily involved with a lot of the acoustic telemetry work that's ongoing uh, throughout Lake Erie. 
so for the outline for this talk, I'll start by just briefly explaining how we study fish movement and uh, move on to some examples uh, to walleye and other uh, invasive or species of restoration concern. And then I'll end with uh, a brief look to the future for new projects that uh, are getting, or hopefully going to be getting off, off the ground uh, starting this field season. So probably the best example of studying fish movement prior to uh, using acoustic telemetry was the Lake Erie walleye tagging program. Uh, and these earliest studies dated back to the 1950s, but the jaw tagging program that uh, I'm sure folks on this, this call um, may have caught one of the jaw tag fish, um, but that just involves putting a, a, some sort of mark onto the fish uh, at a location where you know it was released and then waiting for sport anglers or commercial fishermen uh, in Ontario to report the fish as being harvested. Um, and that's good because it allows us to tag thousands and thousands of fish because uh, little metal bands are relatively cheap. Um, and this figure is just showing uh, each one of these red dots is a location where a walleye that was tagged in the Western Basin was reported as harvested uh, by an angler or a commercial fisherman at some point uh, from the 1990s through uh, the early 2000s. So you get a lot of information, but there's a lot of information that you don't get from these conventional studies. You only get two data points, you know where the fish was released, and you know roughly where the fish was harvested, but you know nothing about where that fish was in between then. And it could be years or even a decade between when the fish was released and when it was harvested. And so, um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of information about the timing of the movements or how consistent those movements were between years. Um, and that brings us to sort of how we uh, now study movement across the Great Lakes. Um, and GLaDOS, the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System, um, was created in 2010. Um, it was funded through the GLRI or Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. This is a federal program that was started by President Obama, uh, and it's been carried through um, uh, to the present day. Um, and this is made possible by um, the federal government giving this grant to the EPA and ultimately making its way to the Great Lakes Fishery Commission who created GLaDOS. Um, it started with four core research projects aimed at uh, addressing critical management needs that were previously not possible without using uh, this advanced technology. So those four projects uh, focused on sea lamprey, which are an invasive species, lake trout, which are a native fish that um, for decades uh, agencies have been trying to restore, walleye, which are a popular sport fish, as we all know, and also lake sturgeon in the Huron Erie Corridor. Um, and initial purchases went towards um, hiring folks that had experience working with this, but also, excuse me, uh, purchasing equipment and the infrastructure that uh, were necessary to enable these large scale tracking projects. So this is an animation that shows the growth of the GLaDOS network. So each one of these blue dots here, as I click this, will be an individual station that's gonna be listening for tagged fish throughout the Great Lakes. And on the right side will be just a laundry list of participating agencies and organizations through time. And this runs for about 11 years. And so you can see that it started in uh, Saginaw Bay and Lake Huron, and then it really started to expand as we get into 2013, 2014. And watch how Lake Erie really starts to fill in. And as I start to show some results from the tagging projects in Lake Erie, um, it's really a, a testament to how well wired Lake Erie is that basically if you tag a fish and you don't see it, um, it's likely that that fish is just dead because it's really hard to swim through the lake without uh, running into one of our listening stations. And so some, some brief summary stats as of late last year, uh, over the first decade of its existence, there's been uh, over well over 14,000 fish that have been tagged. 50 different species, um, and probably now close to 130 projects um, throughout the Great Lakes. 
So in contrast to uh, those, those jaw tags or other, uh, the conventional marks, um, in order to, to track the fish's movement, we use acoustic transmitters. These are, probably have one right here. Uh, folks can see me. This is an acoustic transmitter the size of, uh, in this image. They're electronic tags that transmit an acoustic signal about every two minutes. And as the fish is swimming around in the lake, um, comes within range of one of our acoustic receivers. This is um, one of those listening stations from that animation earlier. Um, it has a range of about um, a kilometer and a half. And on a good day, it can vary based on wind and waves and things like that. Uh, but when the fish come within range of one of these acoustic receivers, the tag goes off. We get a date and a time stamp with a unique identifier to that individual fish. And then we have to physically go out into the lake and retrieve that, uh, that equipment. We download it, put a new battery in it, and we're able to piece together where the different fish were detected throughout the lake. Um, so now uh, I'm gonna move on to some applications of acoustic telemetry to different types of um, fisheries management projects. I'm gonna start by looking at how we've used fish movement to inform control and removal efforts of invasive species. Um, probably the, the most well-known, uh, unfortunately, in Lake Erie is the grass carp. Grass carp is a species of invasive carp, um, along with the silver and big heads. Those are the jumping ones that are in the Chicago area waterway system that we want to keep out. Um, grass carp, unfortunately, have been here for over 40 years, the earliest records uh, in Lake Erie date back to the 1980s. However, in recent years, there's been evidence that uh, there's plenty of suitable habitat for grass carp in Lake Erie, and uh, folks have actually documented successful natural reproduction in the Western Basin. Um, this started in the Sandusky River, but we've also documented it in the Maumee River. And this raised concerns about grass carp uh, from Lake Erie dispersing and leading to establishment in other Great Lakes like Lake Huron, um, and also concerns about, um, excuse me, if the population are, continues to grow in Lake Erie, um, how they might negatively impact aquatic habitat for fish and waterfowl here uh, in Lake Erie. And uh, despite uh, this information and them being around for 40 years, we didn't really have a lot of information to inform our control efforts, um, you know, such as what rivers are they using the most? Are they uh, moving from the west to the east? Uh, things like that. And so we tried to better inform uh, control efforts using this movement. Um, currently, there's the Lake Erie Adaptive Response Strategy. This was put together by um, the different agencies from around the lake. Um, that's led to ongoing removal efforts since 2014. So there's been over 600 grass carp removed by uh, the grass carp strike teams, mainly through electrofishing, uh, this picture on the bottom, and setting large trammel nets. They basically cordon off uh, a stretch of the river and shock it and pull it, and uh, that's how they get a good number of them. Um, but again, how has fish movement been useful for this? So starting in 2014, uh, Michigan DNR, along with Ohio and Michigan State, um, started tagging grass carp. This is Cleo Harris. He's a biologist in Michigan. He was a graduate student on this project. And this is uh, Cleo and I tagging, I believe, the first grass carp that went out into Lake Erie. Uh, you see us putting the tag in there. Um, to date, we've tagged around, I think, 75 of these fish. Um, and over the roughly eight years or so that we've been tagging them, we've looked at broad scale movements uh, to look at the risk of spread to other Great Lakes. So these yellow dots are a fish that were tagged, I believe, near Catawba Island. Uh, and this fish was detected moving up through the Detroit River, through Lake St. Clair, and actually was uh, detected all the way on um, the Bruce Peninsula, presumably on its way to Georgian Bay. Um, and that was the last detection that we had for it. So obviously fish from the West Basin can make these large movements and sort of confirming the fears of fishery managers. Um, specific to Lake Erie, uh, the data were used to look at where the fish were detected 
in different rivers throughout the Western Basin. Uh, so this is a map, the top two panels, top left is um, the Detroit River and these red circles just show the number of different grass carp that were detected on those areas. Um, top right is River Raisin and Plum Creek. And then the bottom two are the Maumee River on the left and the Sandusky River on the bottom right. And basically these are the four highest use tributaries for the Western Basin. And by far and away, uh, most of the fish are using the Sandusky River in Ohio. And so that's been a focus for a lot of removal efforts, but also um, more uh, telemetry work to understand where they're at uh, on a fine scale within the Sandusky River. So this top figure is just showing all of the different listening stations throughout the river. We have receivers or had receivers in the bay and then about every river kilometer in the, in the lower stretch of the river. And we've also have um, listening stations above where the Ballville Dam was. And this big figure panel on the bottom is showing uh, rough locations or mean locations for all of the fish that were in the river over about two years. So from spring of April, 2017 uh, through probably late, early fall of 2019. And you can see in the spring or early summer, these spikes when the fish start to move up river. And those are associated with um, spring discharge or heavy rain events where the river increases in flow. And that's what the, what the carp need for um, spawning. But then you can also see as you get into late summer and early fall, uh, the fish start to move down river. And that's really helped to guide removal effort, efforts during these different times of the year. Um, we've also been considering alternative control efforts. This is a grainy image of a, a proposed barrier, a non-physical barrier that would use uh, things like sound and bubbles to try to de deter grass carp from spawning. Um, this is up near Brady's Island. Um, if folks know where the tackle box or the dar root launches on the Sandusky River, it's around that area. Uh, the red line here would be where the barrier would be proposed, and then some trapping efforts on the side channel here. Um, and this, the idea would be that you would operate this barrier during times when the grass carp would be trying to move up to spawn. Um, but of course, there are native fish like walleye that also spawn during or spawn in the Sandusky River that we would not want this barrier to interfere with. And so we've used a lot of um, telemetry data from walleye, which are this blue line here, to look at their average date of departure from the Sandusky River as their spawning season wraps up. Um, and they're, for walleye, their mean departure date is around April 9th each year. And for grass carp, which are this red or orange line, uh, their mean arrival date isn't until late May. And so there's very little overlap between the walleye using the Sandusky River for their spawning and when the grass carp are starting to show up in that stretch of the river to, to spawn as well. And so this is just showing that for at least for walleye, the potential barrier operation would have little or no impact on their spawning run. So now moving on to examples of how telemetry has informed sport fish management. Uh, black bass on Lake Erie are the third most popular sport fish. Um, tournaments are popular, but one aspect of tournaments is that uh, a number of fish get brought back to a central weigh-in site in most cases. And this raises some concerns about whether or not those bass, and in this case, we, we studied smallmouth, leave the weigh-in site and do they make it from the weigh-in site back out into the main lake or do they move back to where they were caught? Um, and so this was work that was led by Zach Slago, who's another biologist in my office. He and I worked with the Ohio Bass Federation to tag tournament caught fish at a tournament uh, that launched out of the Shelby Street launch uh, in Sandusky, Ohio in September 2018, I believe. Uh, and we monitored, we tagged and monitored movements of smallmouth bass at the release site and out into Lake Erie for about 50 days after the tournament was done. 
And this is a busy site, but we tagged 24 fish. Of those 24 fish, three of them died shortly after I tagged them. Um, 11 entered the main lake. Seven of them remained in Sandusky Bay, so near where they were released after the weigh-in, uh, 50 days after the tournament was done. And one fish actually swam to the west and entered upper Sandusky Bay or the Sandusky River. Um, and the figure on the right here is just showing um, the solid black line is the number of fish that were at the release site through time post-release. And then the dashed line is the number of fish that we had estimated to have moved back out into Lake Erie through time. Um, so about 11 or I think it was like 40% of the fish um, at the end of our study had moved back out into the lake. So clearly uh, the tournaments are having some impact on uh, displacing the bass. So now this is uh, some of those bonus slides that we had alluded to earlier. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, the newest, or I guess it's not new anymore. It's, I've been tagging fish, tagging walleye in the Western basin um, during the, the early, late spring and early summer, um, working with charter captains, such as folks that are on this call to understand what spawning populations are being harvested by the recreational and commercial fisheries across Lake Erie. Um, and this was really challenging, particularly at the start because it requires catching and tagging large numbers of fish. So over the course of about a month, I was trying to tag 100 to 200 fish. Um, and I'm a professional walleye biologist. That does not mean that I'm a professional walleye angler. And uh, I really leaned on uh, the knowledge and ability to put fish in the boat of the Lake Erie Charter Boat Association. So folks like Paul Pachowski uh, and the late Dave Spangler uh, were really, really instrumental in this project success. So um, I wanna thank, if there anyone that's helped me, uh, take me out to tag fish, catch fish, thank you for making this project possible. Um, this has been, I mentioned collaboration and success. So during 2017 to 2019, and again in 2021, um, spent 20 days on the water with 10 plus different charter boats and we've tagged almost 600 walleye, which is amazing. Um, all of this vessel time and crew time were donated as in-kind contributions. Um, and the LACBA has also uh, provided previous and continuing don donations in the form of Lowe's gift cards that have been turned into concrete anchors for deploying uh, our listening stations out throughout the lake. So looking at where some of these fish that we've tagged in the West Basin, so the thought was that these Western Basin fish might be uh, resident fish and not move as far as some of the adults that we've tagged in the past. Uh, and this is just showing kind of a heat map for where fish are detected during the spring. And you can see the darker blues are a little bit further to the west than where I might have expected. Uh, this is spring 2018, spring 2019, and spring 2020. Um, but this is just showing that of most of those fish that we tagged, they seem to be being detected um, most heavily around the, the Ohio Reef Complex, which is sort of what I was expecting to see. Um, and this is just a single year's worth. These, these are only detections for walleye that were tagged in 2017. I have similar data for fish tagged in 2018, 2019, and starting this spring, 2021. Um, and this is just showing where those fish were, again, from only 2017, where they were tagged or where they were detected spawning um, throughout the West Basin. So the reefs are. Um, the most heavily utilized, followed by the Detroit River in most years. Um, the Maumee River is present, usually in low numbers. And then uh, this is kind of interesting. The Sandusky River um, was utilized very, very infrequently. Um, but then there's also a lot of unknowns where the fish were showing up in spots where we wouldn't necessarily expect them to be um, spawning. So like locations out in the central basin, kind of in the middle of nowhere. So it's possible that some of these fish just weren't spawning. Um, and I would urge folks just, I still have a lot of work to do on these analysis. So uh, take this with a grain of salt. Um, of interest to folks on this call, 
where did these Western Basin resident walleye go during the fishing season? Um, it's probably a little bit tough to see these different panels. Basically, if the, the red here means that a fish was outside of the Western Basin, so somewhere to the east of the islands, and green means you're in the Western Basin, so west of the islands. Um, the left panels on each show fish that we tagged from the commercial fishery. These were usually older, larger fish, so uh, they behaved a little bit differently than uh, the sport caught fish intended to move to the east um, throughout the summer. Um, and even for, for the sport fisheries, again, red is fish moving. Sorry, I had that backwards. Red is inside of the West Basin. Green is outside of the West. So for the West Basin resident fish, they tended to stay in the Western Basin throughout the fishing season. So this, these plots start around May 1st and go through about the end of October. And as you move through the summer and the lake warms up, um, those fish tend to move a little bit further to the east. Um, but there's still a good chunk of fish that are remaining in the West Basin throughout the fishing season. Now I'm going to transition to talking about rehabilitation of native fishes. Uh, the first example that I'm going to show is Cisco. Cisco are an important native forage fish that historically, you know, back 100 years ago, uh, supported one of the largest freshwater fisheries in the world. Um, but like a lot of fish were extirpated uh, due to pollution and overfishing. Um, they've recently become the focus of uh, reintroduction efforts across the Great Lakes. Uh, and that's led to questions about how stock Cisco might fare in Lake Erie because Lake Erie today is very different from the Lake Erie of 1922. So in 2021, uh, 100 adult Cisco were released. Um, there were 50 that were released down in Dunkirk, New York, so in the Eastern Basin. And there were 50 that were released uh, off of Huron, Ohio. And the tags that these fish were implanted with estimated the fish's temperature, which we can use as a proxy for how deep the fish was within the water column. And they actually had a casing on them that if the fish was consumed by a walleye or a cormorant or something like that, it actually changes the signal of the tag. And we're, it allows us to uh, know that that fish was eaten by something. And so we were able to look at uh, habitat use and survival of the tagged fish. Um, and this is an, uh, an animation here. So you're gonna see blue and red dots. Red dots are an actual detection for the fish. Blue dot means it was, it's an interpolated uh, position. It means we just didn't know exactly where it was at that time. And so you can see as they get tagged, they start moving throughout the lake. Um, importantly, there's gaps in receivers uh, in the Eastern Basin. That doesn't mean that the receivers aren't there. It just means that we haven't gone out to retrieve them and download the data. And so we expect to get a lot more information here coming in the next couple of months as these receivers get retrieved. Um, but we did see movement away from the release site, which was um, showing at least initial survival. And there was seasonal progression uh, as you get into the summer. Um, moving towards the Ohio Pennsylvania border, which we see with other uh, cold water fish like white, white fish that we've tagged. Um, this is looking at how many of these fish got eaten. Uh, so the green arrow is a predation signal. Uh, and this is just the probability of fish getting eaten through time. And so you take away, and this is just using the data that we have. Um, through the first two months, about 25% of the fish that were stocked uh, got eaten by something. Um, and this is likely to go up again as we add uh, more data in 2022. And this is all really important because there's a, a, a document out there that is outlining the impediments to rehabilitation of Cisco in Lake Erie. And that specifically identified um, predation and habitat use during the summer months. Uh, as key sort of unknowns before a large scale stocking program should proceed. Um, and there is plans to release another 100 Cisco in 2022. So um, 
we'll get uh, a bit more information moving forward. Lake sturgeon are another uh, Lake Erie fish that were formerly abundant and not so much anymore. Um, the Maumee River has a reintroduction plan that's been um, used to, to begin stocking about 3,000 fish uh, annually since I think 2018 was the first year. And the long-term goal of that is to have about 1,500 adults in the river. Um, and um, sorry, telemetry has been used to, to understand how the stock fish are behaving and surviving after release. And so um, I mentioned that there, the goal was about 3,000 uh, fingerlings to be stocked each fall. Not all of those 3,000 fish get tagged with an acoustic transmitter. So about 40, 40 fish each year have been released in 2018, 2019, and 2021. We've examined movement within the Maumee River and also throughout Western Basin of Lake Erie. Um, and the next few slides that I'm gonna show you are um, figures provided by Jordan McKenna, who's a graduate student at the University of Toledo that's leading a lot of this work. So this is showing uh, locations throughout the Western Basin for the 2018 release where the, the lake sturgeon had been detected. Um, you can see a lot of them are detected throughout the Maumee River. Those are the darker blue spots. Um, and there is some movement and detections for the lake sturgeon out throughout the Western Basin. And it seems like um, they're drawn to the Ohio Reef complex as well. That's uh, those cluster of dots uh, on the, be the eastern end of the West Basin. This is a similar figure for the 2019 release. Um, some movement, again, throughout that southern half of the Western Basin. We don't have any data for the 2021 release yet. Uh, those will be coming uh, a little bit later this year. And I mentioned this is a work in progress, but we're working to match detections to habitat data throughout the Western Basin and estimate post-release survival to inform when these rehabilitation goals of uh, when that 1500 uh, adult population might be met. And these are images of uh, lake sturgeon that have been stocked lake sturgeon that have been recaptured. Um, the top picture is our boat captain, Jim McPhee. We caught one of the stocked fish uh, in our trawl survey I think we've done it the last couple of years. This, this picture is probably from 2020 based on the mask. And this is a picture of a, a 2018 fish that was caught by one of the commercial trap netters. Uh, there are a lot of other GLaDOS projects ongoing in Lake Erie that even with the extra time I've been given um, that uh, are just too many to talk about. I touched on Lake Sturgeon. There's also an adult Lake Sturgeon project in the Detroit River. And this is a map showing where uh, one of those fish came down and decided that it was gonna swim laps around Lake Erie a few years ago. Um, there's also an adult sturgeon project on the east end of the lake in Buffalo Harbor and the Niagara River uh, that led to uh, discovery of a spawning site at the mouth of the Niagara River. Um, we've, we've tagged Lake Whitefish which are another native corrigonid species like the Cisco. Um, these are uh, very tasty and harvested by the commercial fisheries and their movements have implications on the Marine Stewardship Council's uh, sustainability certification for the walleye fishery. And so um, we're studying where they move during the summer months as well. Lake trout, I mentioned earlier, they're a species of restoration um, concern or they've been trying to be restored across the Great Lakes and in, in Lake Erie as well for decades with limited success. Um, we've tagged them to look at where they're spawning to try and understand are they picking poor habitat and this actually led to um, discovery of the first wild produced larval lake trout that was caught uh, by folks in New York um, last year at this time. And that was directly informed by detections in different spots uh, throughout the Eastern Basin. And also um, musky from Lake St. Clair. This is a picture of where one of these fish was detected, uh, came down and moved down to Buffalo Harbor. Um, I'm sure folks might've seen the animations of uh, this particular fish because 
he swam from Lake St. Clair down to Buffalo Harbor and come back uh, year after year after year. He tends to go down there and then takes a year off to kind of catch his breath and then does it again. Um, and then just briefly a look to the future uh, projects that are starting in 2022. Um, Ohio Sea Grant um, funded a, a smallmouth bass tagging project. Um, that we're hoping to get tags for starting this year. And the goal of that is to better understand where, when, and how far um, smallmouth bass move around the Western Basin. Um, yellow perch, um, Eric mentioned earlier that um, we're seeing changes in how those fish are foraging and um, we've seen really poor recruitment in recent years. And so obviously something is going on. So we're trying to see where the fish are moving. Um, unfortunately, yellow perch are are smaller, much smaller and more difficult to tag than a, a bass or a walleye. Um, but we've had some encouraging test work. And so we hope to tag 60 or 80 fish uh, in the West Basin this, this fall to look at survival and movement. And our end goal, if we're successful with this tagging is a large scale project where hopefully two or three years from now, um, I'm giving a talk about yellow perch movement instead of walleye. And we can't forget about walleye. Those are uh, still a focus of several new projects. Um, we're working to put tags into, the, into walleye that actually allow us to estimate the fish's swimming depth throughout the year. And so we can use that to look at how they're interacting with things like algal blooms or uh, hypoxia, low dissolved oxygen, and how that changes throughout the year. Um, if you're interested in learning more, there's a GLaDOS website. Um, the address is at the bottom of this slide. Go there, check it out. You can uh, look at on a map of all of the locations where we have receivers listening for a tag fish. You can uh, read more about the different projects, report a tag if you catch a tag walleye, et cetera. Um, with that, I'll thank you for your attention and uh, see if I have time for questions. And then uh, this is also my contact info. Um, if you want to email me or give me a call and talk about fish movement or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's all I got. Thanks, Matt. That's awesome stuff. Uh, so we just had one question come in. Um, if anybody else has questions, please feel free to write them in. And then hopefully Matt can address those again in the Q&A. Uh, Matt, the one that did come in was, what are the chances of stocking more brown trout? Uh, that is not something that I know a whole lot about. Um, I don't think, Eric, if you're on, you might be able to speak to this a little bit better than I can. I don't think Ohio stocks any brown trout. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Pennsylvania, I believe, stocks some, but, but not Ohio. Thank you. Uh, and those are... Those are the only ones, that's the only question that came in so far. Uh, if anybody else has questions for Matt, please type them in. Uh, thank you, Matt, for last minute adding, adding some stuff you weren't planning on presenting. I think it went really well. So uh, thank you for that. And then I am going to be the last presentation for today. Um, I've had some issues sharing and practice. So let me see if we can do this. Christina, please let me know if it looks like it's supposed to look. Nope, we're still on the PowerPoint again. Hmm. I actually did it the other way that time. There you go. All right, folks, uh, so a lot of you probably took part in our Charter Captain survey last year. Um, there were a couple surveys that went out. I'm actually going to address both of those and then a couple of upcoming opportunities um, that you might want to take advantage of. Um, first, just wanted to mention that um, 
you know, we do this survey periodically. Uh, this is the eighth one that we, Ohio Sea Grant, has done since the 80s. Uh, it used to be done by Frank Lickcoppler, for those of you that have been around for a while. Uh, Frank's been retired, so we haven't done one since 2010. Uh, so we wanted to take this time to, uh, again, assess business characteristics and the economic impact of your industry, because it, we know it's a very important uh, impact to local communities and brings a lot of people in from, from non-local locations. Um, I've got a project team towards the end, so I'm going to go ahead and skip forward. So we sent you all mail invites that actually went out with the charter captains, uh, the registration for this conference last year. Uh, and then we also sent three reminder emails. This was the first year we did it all online. It's a little easier to, to get the data that way, um, but we are still working through it. So the stuff I'm presenting today is still preliminary and there will be more um, that we haven't gotten to yet. Uh, the audience size over email after bounce backs and all that stuff was 787 captains and our response rate was about 46 percent uh, now i'm no social scientist but uh, i am told that that's pretty good response rate for an online survey so thank you for all of you that participated in this um, from the data we were able to estimate that 707 active charter firms were around in the 2020 season um, so some numbers we figured out uh, and how they stacked up against 2010, the last time we did this survey, uh, there were 808 licensed captains, which was up 22 from, from 10 years previously. 88% uh, of captains operated their own business, uh, which was up 7%. So less freelance captains and more actually owning their business. 80% of businesses operated a single boat uh, which was actually down 11%, which meant that there were more multi-boat businesses in 2020. Um, the average boat size did not change, that is 28 feet long, uh, and the age was 20 years, which was up three years, so the, the vessels have aged, um, less new vessels in the, in the pack. Um, and then the average six-pack captain had been licensed for 13 years, which also was not a change from 10 years previously, which is a good sign. That means we've got people uh, consistently uh, joining the force here. So good stuff there. Oops, sorry. Uh, this is a chart showing average annual operating costs. Uh, and based on previous years, these costs pretty much stay the same in, in relative amounts. Um, throughout the years. So boat fuel remains the greatest expense. But based on our numbers, people actually spent less, uh, considerably net less, $929 less on fuel than they did in 2010. Um, probably no surprise, boat maintenance, equipment repair, insurance, and labor expenses all increased. Um, some of the things that decreased cost-wise were advertising and office expenses, which makes sense. There are probably more people relying on cheaper or even free options uh, online instead of more expensive traditional options. This was the first time we actually included rods and reels and fishing tackle uh, in our expense chart. Usually those were captured under miscellaneous uh, and this was the third highest expense. So it looks like we probably should have been splitting that out uh, in previous years as well. So if we do this in the future, I'm sure we'll continue to ask that separately. Uh, so overall, the average operating cost for a charter business in 2020 was $12,000 or $12,424. Uh, just a little um, charge uh, data on charge per trip. So these numbers you're seeing on the left are the amount that prices went up on average since 2010. Uh, so you can see most things went up, um, both full day and half day trips for walleye went up considerably. Uh, steelhead, interesting that half day only went up $1. Um, there might be some anomalies in here. Um, but overall, most of these trips went up, some have been considerably so, especially full day smallmouth, full day yellow perch, and um, both full and half day combination trips. Uh, so trips per business, uh, how that changed since 2010, uh, not a lot changed other than more walleye trips. 
Um, so more full day walleye trips and more half day walleye trips and less yellow perch trips. Uh, obviously there are a few pluses or minuses in the other columns as well for the other species. Uh, but overall that comes to a total per business of 3.3 more trips uh, for the 2020 season than they had in 2010. And when you multiply that out by all businesses, that adds 2,333 trips uh, on the lake throughout the whole season. And just some other little tidbits here, 49% uh, of captains ran multiple trips on at least one day in 2020. Uh, so our project team is gonna have to get together and figure out um, what this full day, half day, especially in the walleye trip means. We know that uh, some people don't even offer half days and a full day might only last a couple hours right now with the walleye population uh, being so high and, and hungry. Uh, so that's an interesting note here uh, that's probably different from 2010. And then I mentioned earlier how important it is for folks to be coming in from, from other locations. So we asked how many clients came from more than 50 miles from the captain's home port. And uh, it's estimated that 60% of folks came from, from further than 50 miles. So those are people coming from long distances and bringing money into locations that wouldn't otherwise see that. So uh, that's a pretty big deal. So when you take the price per trip and the number of trips and you multiply that out, um, we can get the average revenue per business. And in this chart, I've got it also by species based on those trips per species. So on average, um, the revenues per business increased $4,773 compared to 2010. Um, the total industry revenue increased almost $5 million. Uh, so the charter industry, according to our data from 2020, uh, brought in $14,609,000. So uh, really, really significant numbers there. And you can see this chart on the right uh, kind of patterns after the, the trips by species, obviously. Uh, but walleye trips make up 88% of the revenue here, which is up 15% from 2010. Uh, one of the questions we asked is perceived important of limit, importance of limit catches for captains. Um, walleye limit importance didn't really change. Uh, yellow perch limits were slightly less important than 2010, according to the respondents. And then steelhead and smallmouth bass limits were considerably less important than 2010. Um, and they, they weren't really marked that important in 2010 either, but they're even, even less so. So people uh, are going out and fishing for those um, and not worried about keeping a limit, which makes sense for those two species. Obviously, 2020 was a weird year. Um, so we wanted to ask a couple of questions to see if we could capture anything about COVID. One of the things we asked was uh, what your thoughts were on the effect of the pandemic to your business in 2020. Um, obviously a big chunk here, more than half said uh, definitely negatively. Um, well, almost half said definitely negatively, uh, but there were a big chunk. So 16% here said definitely positively. And then 9% said probably positively, 13% uh, said no effect. Uh, so it, I guess what that means is it depended on the business. Um, overall, it looks like more people think that there was a negative effect, uh, but some people even saw positive effects, which we have heard anecdotally through more people seeking outdoor recreation opportunities, uh, especially in 2020, once the you guys were able to run again. Uh, there were some um, advertised possibilities for government aid related to the pandemic. Uh, so we asked the question on how many captains applied for and received any of that government aid from any of the major programs that were offered. 94% uh, of captains either did not apply or did apply and did not get that funding. So only 6% of captains uh, were able to receive some aid related to the pandemic. So like I said, there's a lot more data that we just haven't gotten to yet that I'll be sharing with you when, when we do. Um, but I wanted to definitely acknowledge our project team. You can see the names there. I don't need to read them off to you other than I wanna definitely note Mahesha, the first one listed under Ohio State University. She's a student um, within the College of Food, Ag, Environmental Sciences, and she has done a ton of work. And she's the one that created a majority of those figures that were just on that talk. 
Um, so that I've got pause for questions. Um, I'm not seeing any. Feel free to type them in and I will get to them at the end if you do. I want to make sure to touch on, as Chief Wecker mentioned, um, the Ohio Fishing Guide Certification Program. So this would be a voluntary guide certification program. Uh, totally up to you if you want to do it or not. Uh, the goal for this would be to empower the guides to promote the industry, fishery, and conservation-oriented best practices. Uh, so Florida Sea Grant actually started a, a program called Florida Friendly Fishing Guide, and it was very, very successful for them. Uh, so we've been in touch with them about how they did it, and, and they've really helped us shape how we've gone about our, our plans for this so far. And I just added a couple quotes there. I won't read those to you. Uh, you can read them. Uh, but the, there were uh, testimonials from captains that have taken their course and really said it, it helped them out and either marketing or learning the conservation topics and being able to communicate more accurately with their clientele. Um, so there's a variety of possibilities here uh, that we could, we could help you out. Oh, sorry, using my scroll button instead of the arrow. So our team is myself and my director, Chris Winslow. Uh, the Ohio Division of Wildlife has Scott Hale, Travis Hartman, Matt Leibengood, and Eric Weimer. So we've been meeting for um, over a year now uh, and doing various tasks to try to get this out and on the ground. Um, so what have we done so far? Well, we conducted a different survey. So uh, last spring, as you signed up for your guide license, you were able to take a survey uh, straight from the Division of Wildlife's website. And a lot of you took it. I believe we had over 240 responses or right around there. Um, and I've got some information for you there. <clears throat> we, we did that because we wanted to make sure we had buy-in uh, before we offered this. We didn't want to put a lot of work into this and then just not have it be useful to you at all. Um, so I'll show you some results here in a minute. We have held a focus group since then, and we've assembled an advisory committee with various folks from the tourism community uh, from both uh, Western and Central basins. Um, similarly, we've got leadership from Lake Erie Charter Boat Association in the Western Basin and leadership from North Coast Charter Boat Association in the Central Basin. And then Sarah Orlando, our Clean Marinas program coordinator, program manager, excuse me, uh, who in that it, a lot of you are probably aware or even dock at a Clean Marina. It's a similar um, tourism marketing uh, voluntary program uh, that benefits those businesses that decide to go through it. Uh, and we have now started to develop our training modules, which I'll discuss in a minute. So some quick survey results. Like I said, we wanted to make sure that this would be useful to you folks and you would be interested. Uh, so 85% of people that responded to that survey said yes, uh, that would be an interesting program. 88% um, of you said that it would be a useful marketing tool for your industry, which is fantastic. That's what uh, we were hoping to be able to provide. And then a little bit lower, but still considerable, 67% uh, of captains said that customers would care that they held a, a certification like this. We also asked how much time you would be willing to invest in the training. Uh, the average came out to eight hours. Uh, and how much would you be willing to pay for a five-year certification? So we're looking at this program. Once you go through it once, it would last five years before you would need to re-up it. Uh, and that average willingness to pay was $87. Uh, and I want to note that we, we have not made those decisions yet. We have some, some work still to do here, but that gives us a really good kind of starting point on how to frame this program. So like I said earlier, there's a, a bunch of possible benefits that have shaken out through that survey and the focus group that we held. And that focus group was with, uh, I believe we had 10 or 12 captains. Again, we made sure to get folks from both Western and Central Basin and some small boat captains, large boat captains, casters, trollers. So we wanted to make sure we got a variety of opinions in there. And so some of the things that shook out, the number one would be a name on your name on a publicly available list of certified fishing guides. So I've got a picture here from the website from the Florida Friendly Fishing Guide Program. And they do the same thing. They have a list that they can share with folks. So if somebody wants to know who a captain is that they could go with, they can just post that online or send that link to folks to, to really promote you as a captain that has taken this certification. 
um, a decal for vessel. So there's Florida's logo. We would obviously have our own in Ohio. We are still working on what that would look like. Um, but uh, reputation is a firm known for responsible Lake Erie stewardship. Um, I mentioned the logo. Not only would it be a decal, but you could also use it on your print materials potentially. Um, Florida gives certification completion kits. That was less of a big deal uh, from what we found on our survey and focus group, uh, but certainly being able to provide you with information that you can use as resources uh, to, to communicate with your clientele would be a big one. Um, and then again, using it as a marketing tool to help you get your business out there and get more business. So what would this look like? Uh, training would be all online and self-paced. So it would basically be an online course through Ohio State. Now you wouldn't have to sign up for tuition or anything like that. You wouldn't need anything special other than an account, uh, but it would be online. And right now it looks like we would have enough material and, and fit a lot of good stuff into four hours. So that's a total time investment of four hours. Again, self-paced. So you could sit down and go through it at 15 minutes, 30 minutes at a time and come back to it uh, the next week, the next day, however you want to do that. Um, the cost would depend on material costs. So again, we're working through that right now. Um, definitely using that survey data and focus group data to, to make those decisions. Um, again, we, we said that certification will last five years. We're aware that information uh, that we conservation information will probably be updated before five years. So as that is updated, we'd be able to update those resources, fact sheets and things that we would we would deliver to you as being a, someone that completed the certification. And as Chief Wecker said, we are developing this hopefully throughout this year and we want it to be live uh, for the 2023 season. Um, so the modules that we are working on currently involve best practices for harvesting and releasing fish, uh, understanding fisheries management process, boating safety, aquatic invasive species, engagement in the management process, so how you and your anglers contribute, uh, nutrient loading, harmful algal blooms in the dead zone, and aquatic ecology and limnology. So those are our top seven that shook out through the survey. Um, and then we have several options for number eight. We do plan on having an eighth module. We've got some ideas, um, but we're currently looking for experts and plan on fleshing that out a little more uh, as we roll through these. So I'm going to pause for questions there. Uh, got Somebody saying that they would do that. Uh, that's fantastic news. Thank you. Uh, we look forward to getting it out there. We really think, uh, I'm really excited about it. So we've had a, a lot of group meetings with our project team and uh, we've seen some, some of the outlines and we're, we're going through giving comments and I'm really excited to get that information out. Uh, it's gonna be a lot of work, but I think it's gonna be well worth it. So um, looking forward to it. Feel free if you don't have questions now, but you have questions later, feel free to reach out to me uh, and I'm happy to talk to you about that in further detail. And I believe my one more opportunity I wanted to briefly touch on because we do not have the agenda ready for this and we do not have registration open. That'll probably be later this spring or early summer. Uh, some of you have probably attended our Charter Captain Day at Stone Labs, so we've been able to do this uh, every other year, typically, for the last, oh, I don't know, five or ten years, somewhere in there. Obviously, we weren't able to do it last year uh, or the year before, I believe, but we are planning on doing it this year. So if you're not aware, if you've not been up there before, it's about a half a day. Uh, where you get to come out to Stone Lab, see the facilities, uh, hear experts give talks on a couple of, on a couple of uh, high level topics. And then we actually get you out on a boat and pool a fish trawl and get you into the labs and, and go over a bunch of the scientific information. So it's a really, really educational day, hands on. Uh, that is going to be Tuesday, August 30th. Um, and again, it's very limited. It's not like this meeting where we can have 150 to 200 people there, unfortunately. Uh, so it'll probably be limited to more uh, like 30 people. Uh, so please keep an eye out for that if you are interested. And uh, that, that will probably go out to the email list that went out for this meeting. 
uh, or maybe the LACBA email list as well. So uh, keep an eye out for that and save that date if you're interested. Uh, it is a really fun and educational day. So hopefully see some of you there. And that is all I have. Uh, so other than this slide where I get to uh, shamelessly promote my family fishing. So uh, I end all of my talks with this slide or as many of them as I can, uh, because I really do think it's important. Um, I'm sure you guys have seen this as well. When you get a kid on the boat and just see their eyes light up pulling in, even if it's just the sheephead, but if they get a big walleye, they get to throw in the cooler, uh, it really changes uh, their perspective. And I, I really think a lot of our issues that we're working on on Lake Erie involve people caring about that resource. And the best way to do that is to uh, get them hands-on on it at an early age. And what better way to do that than and getting them on a boat and catching fish. So um, that is what I have for you from my presentations. I'm going to check out the Q&A box here. Uh, I don't have questions, but a couple more captains saying that they would be interested in the class. Um, that's fantastic. Thank you guys. Uh, it's great to hear. We are we are full go on, on implementing those. So what we're going to do now is, is put together those modules and we're going to have to work to do some video editing that is is relatively new to me but we've got some good folks that that can help us do that so again hopefully by the end of this year end of the season uh, maybe ideally it would be something that we could get to you so you could work on it over the winter before the spring uh so before your season of 2023 starts so that is our goal right now um and we're we're full steam ahead so. and that is all we have on the agenda. Uh, it is 11.32. We're actually two minutes over, so apologies for that. Um, but thank you again. Thank you very much to all of our speakers for joining us. Uh, thank you to everybody that was able to join and spend your morning with us. I know screen time's uh, probably being overloaded for all of us now. And again, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully that this will be an in-person event next year. Um, but we do want to appreciate everybody for bringing this awesome information to us today. Uh, and again, it will be recorded and sent to you. You can share that with whoever you want once you get that recording. And as Christina said, uh, please take time to fill out our survey as well. That is all I have for you.